everyone, Ian Shadden here, and uh, today's training stream, we're gonna be going over some uh, stuff with AI, but specifically within Bullet Train. So Bullet Train was a demo we just showed off here at Oculus Connect. It would normally use like hand controllers and the full VR headset, but I'm going to be showing it off on using just the demo pawn that, you know, basically what I had to use through the production of the AI. And uh, before we get into it, you know, there's been a lot of comments about, you know, the AI and it's basically terrible and I'm like, yep, it is. Uh, within the constraints that we had to work with, uh, had to keep everything below, let's say, 11 milliseconds so that it works really well on the Oculus Rift. And the, uh, the concept of it, you just being completely awesome and everybody else is just kind of stormtrooper-ish and bad and whatever, and so you can just lay waste to them. Yep, they run right up to you, they stand there, they chuck grenades at their own feet. They're basically the most awful soldiers on the planet because, uh, quite honestly, if you make them too good, it's no fun. Uh, there was an earlier iteration that I did in the first two weeks of my work on it where they ducked behind cover and they uh, shot at you accurately and they, they moved around and only popped up when you weren't looking at them and that kind of stuff. And it was actually incredibly boring. Um, and they were too good. They moved when you couldn't see them. They always moved between cover as long as, you know, that kind of stuff was good for them. And uh, it wasn't fun. Uh, this was, once you get into the experience, it's, it's really kind of just like visceral. It's not about them being smart. So since mostly what's up there is just a video, uh, I figured I don't think anybody else has done this. Uh, I don't, maybe somebody can correct me, but I'm gonna actually show off how the demo runs from beginning to end in the, you just using the demo pawn. So uh, if, let's go ahead and switch to that and we'll just uh, go ahead and play an editor. Oh man, I didn't ask, do we have sound on? Oh, or we'll just crash. Yay! Yay! <sighs> I don't know why it does that. Sorry, guys. So while, it re while it's reloading, uh, hopefully I'll be able to get it to actually run here and we can at least go through the, uh, the, uh, the, the demo portion of, maybe it might just be the, yeah, the crash monkey. Hi, monkey! <laughs> uh, uh, wrong way. Uh, 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 there we go. Uh, 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 hey! Uh, whatever. So, we'll uh, get it back up and running here and hopefully I'll be able to go through the, uh, I have 0% dry space left apparently. Uh, we'll get it going through the, uh, the non-intro sequence where the training occurs and I'll show you the physical uh, experience and if it crashes again, we'll just jump, in, jump into the, the, my uh, AI test map and we'll start, we'll just jump into what we did uh, to make the AI efficient, to do what it needs to do and not a whole lot more. So currently loading, because loading, I'm not seeing anything really interesting on chat either. So uh, uh, there's an owl now? How many of these things do you have? Oh, hello, Owl. All right, editor's back up. Let's cross your fingers, everyone. I'm not going to risk it. We're going straight to straight to demo pawn because that at least appeared to run. Yeah, hashtag don't crash. <laughs> Absolutely. <sighs> Loading, define complex. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Alexander. That's not going to crash on this part. Never does, right? It's, it always crashes when you try to play. Oh, and there's a line now. <laughs> does it just loop? Uh, all right. Nope. It is, it just does not want to run. All right, well, sorry guys, we're gonna have to jump into uh, the uh, the uh, demo map that I have, because it's apparently, so Fortnite's on after me, and Drive C is currently saying it has no space left, so all I can assume is it has something to do with that. Um, so we'll, uh, I mean, if I could just find their stuff and delete it. <laughs> 
I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, we won't. We we won't we won't do that. Man, if there's only something else. Well, we have like five different versions of Visual Studio on here. Yeah, thankfully they're kind of small. All right. Come on, demo map. Yep, oh, oh, not even maps there. Now there's a monkey behind me. Can you just put those things anywhere you want? Okay. Oh, I see AI maps. Now he's... Ah, uh. <laughs> All right, Hogan's Alley. Here we go. So, yeah, we're good. Go ahead and <laughs> switch. <up. laughs> yeah, having too much fun with this. All right. So, sorry about that. It looks like the main map just doesn't want to load. So, we'll just go ahead and kick in here. This is the demo map I put together. Well, actually, uh, uh, Zach Parrish put this together to start, and I just kind of built on it. So, we're going to start over here. And we have a spawn point back here for our guys who are going to come running out and being all terrible. So let's go ahead and hit play. And you'll see that we start in the ground. I'm just hitting some keys, backspace and R, and then Alt. And you see we have our floaty hands for VR. And here they come. So they get within a certain range. They start firing. In general, they are attempting to move to a location that is somewhere in front of me. And you'll see them duck down, mainly because if somebody's behind them and they want to fire, it actually tells them to duck. And then they get really, really terrible because you want to know why? They're not supposed to live this long. They're not. I'm supposed to be just wailing on these guys and completely taking them to crash. <sighs> Breathe deep and be calm and figure out if there's absolutely anything that you can delete off this machine. Because this... You just need the Fortnite launcher? All right, hold on. Yeah, yeah, all right, that's fair. Let's, uh, let's see what we have to uninstall. Yeah, debug on the fly for hard drive space. Microsoft Visual Studio. Oh no, see these are all redists. Something, anything to just free up a couple gigs. All right, there it is. I'm sorry. You're gonna. You're you're going away. Uninstall. Yup. Now cross your fingers, this doesn't break everything as well. Really, I just need the drive space, I think. Because it's literally talking about, you have zero drive space. For <laughs> what the? Is that a basketball? <laughs> All right, let's talk AI. We won't load anything. <laughs> one more? Okay, okay, there you go. One more basketball. <laughs> You're having way too much fun with this, by the way. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Destroyer of training content. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, you can't see on my screen, but I'm uninstalling Visual Studio 2013 community and reloading the editor. <laughs> This is either going to be like the best stream ever or the worst stream ever. All right. All right. Okay. So anyway, you guys got a you guys got a chance to see what the AI was doing. They run right at you. They're pretty much terrible, and they do some fun things, but otherwise they're they're pretty jank. So, um, and I don't mind saying that I made them. So and that was kind of like the way that they were meant to be. So let's go ahead and look at their main behavior tree. All right, so in the main behavior tree, um, it's almost basically just a duplicate of 
So this section right here is an initialization that is never run again, but then this section down here on the, on the bottom is run all the other times. So if we just run through it, uh, we're just asking, say, is initialization not set? So are we initialized or not? And if we're, if we're not, then okay, let's do this, because obviously we would just spawn. Uh, an animation offset kind of thing, we just randomly wait a certain amount of time, and then we're allowed to go. This prevents your guys from all syncing to the same idle or same run, which can be really, really terrible looking. We set our target, and uh, that's just our target player. By the way, these are all blueprints. None of this outside of the default nodes was done in C++, which, by the way, if you guys really want to write this down, if you want performance gains, do all your tasks, services, decorators, the whole nine yards. If you can, do them in C++. Uh, the cost savings is absolutely immense, and you can get away with a lot more. I mean, it's just blueprints are awesome. Love them. Got us this far. We were able to make it performant, but you get at least 10x performance out of doing it in C++. Might as well do it. So anyway, after getting our target player, we're actually going to go ahead and set a location on our pawn, mostly for storage. Um, and then we're setting a couple bulls. In this case, don't face. we're not going to face the player. There are some variables set up that uh, force him to run the direction he wants to, the, the direction that he's, face the direction he's moving, or if he wants to face the player. So this is, that's what this one does. Sprint in, we're setting our movement speed. There are three speeds that we set, and you can actually see those up here in the corner. Oh, actually, I guess you guys can't. There we go. Uh, just a quick enum, walk, jog, sprint, um, correlates to the, uh, the animation speeds that we have in the animation set whether or not we use our aim offsets or not. And then there is a command AI who sits above all the other guys on the field, and he says, hey, I'm going to update your positions. I'm going to tell you where to go, and I'm going to tell you whether or not you want to melee attack the guy, or melee attack the player, or if you want to throw a grenade. So until he has given me a position, I'm not going to do anything. So this actually just, uh, just grabs and holds execution. That's all this does and waits for a value to be set. And actually, it just sets a quick timer to, uh, hey, every two seconds, if my position isn't updated, I need to go ahead and request that, because the command AI is probably slacking. Um, and then the rest of it is, hey, is this key set? If so, OK, cool, close the gate and finish execution. We have succeeded. Continue on with life. Once we know we have a position, what the position is is whether we're near mid, or far away from the player. And it runs the same EQS for each one of these. However, we've set up some query parameters, which actually set our minimum maximum range for the EQS being run. So in this case, it's 350 units to 450 units, or 450 to 600, or 600 to 750. And if absolutely we cannot find a position in there, mainly because of the railroad tracks, which we do not allow them to stand on, we'll push it back to 1250 and 1500. Now, remember these are all in centimeters, so that's 12.5 meters to 15 meters. Okay, we have a, a location that we want to move to. We're going to go ahead and store that on the pawn because we can use that on the pawn for other things. Uh, he's doing some calculations, like how far off am I from the place that I want to look and to whether or not to turn quickly towards that. And then we get into actual movement. He's going to be like, okay, we're moving. So we have some services running. We're doing some range checks, whether or not we want, basically if we want to change speed. So in this case, he's going to sprint into the player, but we don't want him to stop moving. So we're going to do a range check and say, hey, am I so far from the player? Okay, cool. Let's set an engaged flag, and then let's lower our speed. So that way we walk to draw, drop to jog, bring up a rifle, and then we can start to actually engage the player, shoot at him. And then we're doing a jam check. So all of these done... Are, are done on a, you know, this one is done on a, a random amount. That way they, you know, they don't all just engage at a thousand meters or a thousand units. They're just like done, right? So we're, we're kind of fuzzing that by saying, oh, only check so often. And then we're doing a jam check. Basically, you know, you saw how the guys were kind of like, they were trying to move together and squish themselves together. The jam check says, am I making good enough progress within a certain amount of time? If not, then I'm jammed. And if we're jammed, we'll actually go ahead and rerun where we want to be down here. So we'll set a new location. And then in here, we have an adjustable move too. That is 
essentially, it's exactly, I mean, our basic thing is move to, right? And then within it, that can go away. Within it, and this can go away. This needs serious cleanup. Um, we say, hey, if I'm jammed and our target location is not equal to our current desired move location, then we have throw in a slight delay because we're waiting for the service up above to say, oh, or we're waiting for a new location to come in and we don't just want to hammer on this every tick. We just want to like, calm down. Okay, now allow it through. Okay, we have a new location, set our new location, and then move to that location. So if they ever stop and slow down, then we'll get there. The reason we did this was because we do have detour AI controllers, which are really nice. The problem with the detour AI controller is once two things start to get kind of close together, they stall, they, they, kind of, they kind of squish together and they go real slow. But also they do it if they're getting too close to an obstacle, like a barrier, or say I want to mantle up and over something, they kind of, oh, okay, squish, 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 squish. Okay, I'm going over now. So we wanted to avoid that. So this is just a kind of a way it's like, okay, I'm not making forward progress. Stop, recalculate, move. And since this is all done right within this, they never stop moving. So they will just simply decide to like, oh, nope, I'm going left. And they'll just, there they go. All right. So with that all done, um, so they're moving, whether or not we face the player or not. And in this case, whether or not we are allowed to engage the player and actually, uh, if we need to reload, in this case is actually down here. Uh, not technically necessary, but they can fire on their way in. Um, once they get to their, their desired location within this case, we finalize our initialization. So set only melee to false, melee, pardon, to false. Don't face the player. And then this one is, uh, we, uh, this one is setting target location to true. I think this is a holdover from something else. And this one is also init complete, complete. Uh, the, I don't know what target location, it shouldn't be allowed to be set to true. So, whatever. Um, it's not broken right now and I'm afraid to remove it just in case it breaks something else. Once it gets done, we go down our main tree here. So, movement, just like it was above, except while we're on the move, we're allowed to engage the player. Um, basically, we're uh, the service here, fire gun, is every once in a while he's just going to See if he can shoot, and if he can, he does. Ammo check, do we need to reload? If so, uh, there is a reload functionality um, outside of this. It's actually right up here. And it did not make it down into there, which is fine. Uh, I think it wasn't necessary at the time. They never really reloaded on the move anyway. Uh, it wasn't actually necessary. And whether or not we need to set crouch or not, this is basically just, hey, are we in the inner ring? Let's go ahead and crouch. Um, now we'll move up over here. This is actually our engagement section. Whether or not we want to throw a grenade. If we want to throw a grenade, great, throw a grenade. Okay, we don't want to throw a grenade. Okay, well fine, just stand there and shoot at the player. Do a whole bunch of loops. Lots of little random wait times here and there. And then <coughs> they will fire at the player in this case, they will do three loops of a burst of two to three shots. There you go. And then finally, if the commander has told us we want to melee the player, this whole section here is face the player, sprint towards the player, punch him in the face, rinse, repeat. Um, there's just a lot of setting bulls like we don't want to be crouched, movement speed set to sprint. Uh, we want to. We don't want to face the player because then we're using our aim offsets to face the player, right? We want to just kind of face the direction we're moving, and then we're moving to the target player location and not the player, just in case you teleport away. And all of this happens and it loops and it loops and it loops and it loops until they explode. So they're shooting at you. Lots of bullets are flying in the air. Lots of good stuff going on. And if you let them live, they look terrible. Absolutely look terrible. But since they're dying all the time, it's so much fun. It is ridiculous how much fun it is just to pick up the pistol and start wailing on them. 
Okay, so this one is about things like performance and whatnot. A lot of the performance tricks we did were limiting how often something happens. So I was in the, uh, the node where it's like, hey, I'm waiting for my position. So instead of hammering that gateway, it hits that branch and says, no, nope, no further, no further, no further, no further. And then every, every time it, it goes through, it's like, okay, half a second, okay, we're allowed to go through, we're allowed to go through. That limits how often we're saying to the controller, hey, recalculate my position, because that can get really heavy real quick. Um, doing everything on tick, say for our services, for our simple range check and our jam check, would get incredibly expensive. I mean, dot products, it doesn't seem like a lot, but there are six of these guys, and if they're you know running a dot product on locations that are changing every frame, it can get expensive in, in Blueprint. Um, our reload checks, you know, again, all of this is, hey, we want to know if we want to fire a gun every 0.25 seconds. You know, we we don't do it every, that's every, you know, fourth of a second we're saying, hey, should should I fire? Um, and then, you know, our ammo check every 0.2 seconds. This could be increased every half second. But we got it down to the performance levels where it was acceptable. Is there more we could do to this? Oh, oh, yes. Oh, 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 yes. I mean, outside of just the C++ stuff, we never really sleep the guys. I mean, the closest we come to sleeping is when we're, uh, we're waiting for a position. And at that point, you know, they're not doing anything. They're not moving. They're not doing anything. Uh, movement. Movement eats it up a lot. But during, the, uh, during development, I found two really interesting cases. Um, one case was the, uh, we actually have two behavior trees. The other behavior tree is when the player teleports. So when the player teleports, uh, there is a, uh, the game mode calls out and says, hey, players teleported, all AI, just letting you know. The AI immediately stop what they're doing and they are forced to run this behavior tree. It is, there's no question, they don't get to complete whatever they're doing. It's, they cease fire, stop moving, don't face the player, stand up if you're crouching, and then reset the player location for the location where they've teleported. Um, and this is like, they're surprised, like, oh, where'd he go? Oh, I don't know where he went, he teleported, he's a magical man. And from here, we do a bunch of tests and we ask, can I still see the player? Yes, okay, point him out. Be like, hey, he's over there. Can I not see the player? I don't know where he went. Did the player teleport directly to me and he's within range of me? I'm going to punch him in the face and that's all there is to it. The performance saver though ends up being this little node right here. Force run next behavior tree. So we have a, uh, uh, a behavior tree node, right? This nests it. And I was talking to uh, Wukash, one of our other AI programmers, and supposedly there's a, not, I wouldn't call it an issue, but there's overhead with these. Um, actually some pretty substantial overhead where it's like, it's actually processing through this tree, down to this tree, and through it, and it has to allocate memory and do a, a bunch of other stuff every time it runs. So, didn't do that. Force run behavior tree is very, very simple. It is simply saying, hey, controller. I'm going to cast it to my enemy AI controller and I'm going to go ahead and get the game mode and cast that and for I don't know this is a holdover from something because that doesn't do anything except eat resources. So we're not going to do that anymore. And then we tell the AI controller to run a behavior tree which by the way is right on the other end is literally run uh, pardon pull off here, run behavior tree. That's what's on the other end there. So it's just an event on the um, uh, on the AI controller that makes this happen. And then we have an exposed reference to a behavior tree. So in our, right here, we can say, oh, behavior tree to run after init. Sweet, there it is. I can run any number of behavior trees wherever I desire and it is actually more efficient to do that than it is to use the nested behavior tree stuff for what we are specifically doing, which is we're doing a large chunk switch out. If you were doing smaller stuff, it'd probably be just fine. It's just you gotta remember that there's, there's an overhead for using those things. 
Um, so this saved a minor chunk, not huge or anything, but this saved actually a reasonable minor chunk. The other, and I don't even want to call it savings per se, it was, <laughs> it was offsetting. So spawning things is expensive and we were spawning a ton of bullets. So I believe uh, Wukash got to the point where we pooled bullets. But before then, it looked like the AI was wasting upwards of 10 milliseconds a frame spawning bullets. And that comes from the way that we were um, firing the gun. The gun has its own uh, the way for it to work. And so if we look at our, our task for firing the gun, we're saying, hey, get the enemy AI controller. And we're saying, hey, fire gun start, putting in a delay, and fire gun stop. The problem was, is originally, this was calling directly to the gun. So my AI was skipping over the controller, skipping over the pawn, and saying, hey, that gun you're holding, I'm going to make it do things. So this is, this is a tiered step down thing, where it's like fire gun here, fire gun next, fire gun next, and then it finally gets down to the gun and it says fire, which appropriately puts the cost for what's going on onto the gun. Before, what would happen is all of these guys in this little section right here, they'd lock execution. So I'm spotting a bunch of bullets, and this isn't being allowed to complete. So while it's over there spawning, I'm wasting 10 milliseconds here. Not really, but I am wasting 10 milliseconds and spawning a whole bunch of bullets. So sometimes the uh, hunting down a performance in AI, in this case, it's like, well, where, where was this coming from? It's like, how can, this, how can this little thing right here be wasting 10 milliseconds? Thankfully, it wasn't me. Um, and we changed it, so now you know the bullets are pooled, so they don't do that. Um, but at the time, it was just like, it was racking my brain. How is this happening? And maybe if we have some drive space here, all specified components, yay, hold on. Do we, do we, have, do we have drive space? Maybe, we, maybe this will work. Oh, we have five gigs free. Do we risk it? All right, let's, let's, let's risk it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show, you, you, if I remember correctly, there was a, a training stream that went over the uh, session front end, right? Um, so I'm going to show you how we, we, we hunted that down. <laughs> so let's load up. We'll, we'll make this as, we'll, we'll try to, uh, <laughs> not, you have the monkey ready? All right. Monkey's ready, guys. <laughs> Wait for it. Oh, I almost thought I was going to crash. So session front end. A couple things we need to do. I probably already got them set up, but we're going to play in a standalone game. And we need an additional launch parameter of DAS messaging. So this is just editor preferences, play, play and standalone game, additional launch parameters, messaging. OK, cool. And then we're going to go ahead and do that. So at this point, cross your fingers and start, that, start up that hashtag. Uh, standalone, I don't, no, we don't need to say. We actually didn't really change anything. While well, it's loading, developer tools, session front end. So I am by no means an expert at the session front end. I'm sure there's somebody here at Epic who will watch this stream and be like, why did you do that? Just, just no. Um, but it did help me hunt down quite a few things. So in the session front end, we're gonna go ahead and drop into Profiler. We're uh, waiting for our application to load but it's going to probably, I think it's going to be this unnamed session uh, once it finally gets up and running. So I've just clicked over there. It'll pop up when it's ready. Then we're going to go ahead and do data capture, data preview, just so that we can see it's working. We'll let the AI do a couple of things, and they'll dance around, they'll shoot, and then we'll stop it. We'll come back into here, and we'll, uh, we'll see how expensive some of the things are that we're doing. Okay, so we're up, so I'm going to hit Alt and R. And the AI is going to start running, unnamed session. Yep, OK, data capture, data preview. All right, we're getting data coming through. And here they are. They're running at me. They're climbing up walls. They're shooting, shooting. 
Somebody. Oh, I got your bullet. You're dead. Uh, give me that. No, no. Give me it. No, no, no. Come on. Fine. I'll grab that gun. Nope. Grab your bullet. There, grab your gun. Shoot a couple guys. That way we get some respawn going. Guy meleeed me. Slow mo's kicking in. And then chuck my gun. Give me that gun. Space bar. Throw that gun at Mach 10. Teleport over. Oh, yeah, this, this looks like it's actually working. I should probably try to actually. No, I'm not going to do that. I'll just jinx it. Nope, oh, missed him. Okay. We've got enough data. We'll hit escape. And we'll wait for the, the data to process. And while it's doing that, we can look over here on the side. We have AI, AI EQS, AI behavior tree, and AI crowd, right? Like these are generalist kind of uh, categories for the big systems in the background that we're running. And so we can go ahead and say that, you know, in general, we were below 33 milliseconds on processing. This is our game thread anyway. And so all in all, not completely terrible for, for the game thread, but I mean, the render thread stacks on top of that. And so, you know, what can you do? Um, and this computer is, in comparison to what we actually run the demo on, this computer is probably incredibly underpowered. Um, but it is actually more powerful than my machine. So there's that. Uh, so we can see, yeah, it's got enough time. We can see, let's, let's assume for a moment, oh, let's see, e EQS, test time. Okay, so we mouse over the little tag at the end here. We can see, oh, well, min average was only 0 0.004 milliseconds. Max was 0 0.341 milliseconds. Eh, okay, that's not that big of a deal. Work, max out at 0 0.722 milliseconds. Mm, that could be an issue. Unfinished, holy, wow, 13.052 milliseconds at one point. So let's double click that one. And let's see if we can't uh, find us a spike. So by bringing, oh, wow, okay, so it chooses the same color. That's, that's awesome. Can it not do that? No, it's going to be the same color. So now we need to find, well, there's one spike, but that's below the threshold. Continue over, that's below, below. This line right here, by the way, is 10 milliseconds. By the way, that's basically the entire budget for the game <laughs> for running on the, the higher end machines. And, uh, no, I am not finding anything that's actually hitting 13, maybe in the beginning. It's just really hard to see. No. No, I'm not seeing it. Wait, no, there we go. Here it is. So here's that spike. So we can see that, yeah, it spiked. That's, that's it. Like, it spiked above everything else. So now that we know that it's there, I can, you can either do this by, like, range. So you can do that and it'll update down here at the bottom the things that you're looking at. Or you can just click on a single frame like that, which is what I want to do. And so I want to know what more is going on here. So let's do, uh, it, it, it's kind of hard to go through this if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Like it's in the game thread somewhere, frame time, on game engine tech, world time, um, Oh, what's the next one? Is it tick time, pre-physics, release tick group, something, 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 something. Okay, let's not do that. Let's, instead, we can organize uh, by exclusive, just how much, just individual little things. And then we can organize by name. And we can go, actually, we can do by inclusive time. And we know it's about, what, 13 something? 13.052 milliseconds. Yeah, you can just scroll down. And if somebody knows how to search this thing, nobody's ever told me how to do that. Oh, there it is. So if we click that, we see tick on finish delegates, and then we go back to hierarchical. And there we can see, oh, okay, well, inclusive time is showing me, hmm, blueprint time is pretty heavy here. Okay, it's happening in Hogan's Alley, persistent level. Okay, something in the persistent level. Uh, finish event, shooting up, oh, it's in the shooting game. Shooting game, persistent level, spawn AI from class. Yep, yep, spawn actor time, there it is. 
So we are actually using EQS as a way to choose places to spawn. So whether or not they're in front of the player, behind the player, to the left of the player, or whether or not you can see them or not. All of these things play into that EQS, and there's a delegate callback for that. Actually, I can crack that open here in a second. I'll show you guys how that's actually operating. But we can see that spawning guys, that first initial set of spawning guys, 8.507 milliseconds, 66.4% of the time for this, everything else going on with all of that. So that's pretty heavy. Like I said, spawning, spawning stuff is expensive. Um, and so, but it's being lumped into the on finish delegate because it's all happening kind of at the same time. It's like a, it's a chain of events that then has to release back up the chain. And so they are spawn is a part of that. Our actual time for the EQS, see if we can actually find that. Uh, hold on. Finish, yeah, on finish query event. 13.026 comparatively to 13, it's either, no, it goes which way? No, it adds to the one below it. So it is 0 0.06 milliseconds to finish the act, to actually have the callback event happen. But again, it's being lumped in. And so by viewing it in this fashion, we can be like, oh, okay, there's the thing that's causing all the problems. Maybe I should pool my guys. That's an option. That would have saved a massive amount of time on individual frames where guys are spawning, especially if they took and throw a grenade out there. They throw a grenade, they're going to throw it at their feet, and they're going to kill all themselves. And it's just, then you have six dudes that are trying to spawn. So, and then it's going to be choosing all over the map for them to lay out. And so, uh, just right quick so you guys can see how that's happening. Let's, uh, oh man, there's just so much more. I'm going to have to do an entire stream over just the holistic view of your pawn, controller, EQS, behavior tree, game mode, I mean, all of it just all together into one package because they all do things so, like, mm, they all affect things in so many different ways that it's just like, we can talk about behavior trees and we can see how it's doing things, but really it's like, if you force update your pawn to rotate without using the controller stuff, you actually call into update overlaps again which can destroy your performance. And if you're doing that on tick, uh, yeah, I did that. Like, <laughs> like I, I know this because it's like, it's something I've done. So, I mean, there's a whole, whole list of holistic things we should go over. Okay, so, sorry, I'm getting detracted. Uh, VR shooting game. All right, so, there we go. Spawning dudes, spawning dudes, spawning dudes. Okay, so if an enemy dies, then, and actually also we will attempt to do it every so often, basically we will attempt to respawn a guy every two seconds just in case something gets dropped. And if the number of dudes on the field is less than the number that we want, we're gonna spawn a guy. To do that, uh, this is just an enum switch. Uh, this is a blueprint enum that's just you know, near, far, high, low. It's being set in the game mode, or pardon, uh, in the level blueprint for the uh, for the actual game. So they, you know, they could spawn on, on the escalator below you, above you, near to you, or far from you. And each one of these is has an EQS that goes with it. That uh, an EQS query that goes with it that just simply gets all of the spawn points in the area and says these are the best, but nothing is ever omitted just in case something, for whatever reason, gets dropped. That way you don't end up with fewer guys on the field than what you should have. Um, but it'll favor the, the locations that where you really want them to go first. And so we pass it into a run EQS query node. And we pass back, we want everything to return, we want them all matching. And then what happens is we bind a delegate. I mean, if you just pull off of this and you're like, assign. You assign on query finished. It creates this magical node right here for you. And then you wire this little red node into the events you want to happen whenever this callback occurs. So in C++, EQS is running in the background. It's doing its stuff. It's choosing for you. And then it says, okay, I'm done. And so 
it knows to say, oh, I'm done. Hey, on query finished event underscore event underscore zero. Great naming. Um, go ahead and do your thing. And it says, okay. And it passes back its query instance and its query status. The query instance is basically your results. So we're going to go ahead and get all these results as actors. And basically, this is a for loop that just starts going through these from high to low and asking whether or not the spawn has a cooldown running or not. That way, we don't get guys stacking up on a single point. And if it has a cooldown and it says, OK, get the next one in line, get the next one in line, get the next one in line. And if it gets one before then, it says, OK, I'm going to set it, I'm going to set the cooldown on that spawn point, break out of this loop, and we're going to you pull that index, basically, and spawn found, get it, get that location, make sure that it is not equal to 0, 0, 0, because that's the center of the world, and that's the error location, just in case, and then we spawn our guy. Um, we make sure to cast him, and we bind an event to killed, which does this chunk of data down here whenever he dies. Uh, essentially, respawn a guy, remove a guy from a list, and uh, I believe that was it. Well, there's, there's a callback to the um, level blueprint that says, hey, last enemy killed. Okay, well, then we can spawn the boss. Um, yeah, so there's a whole lot of stuff going on in the game mode that also affects how the AI works. But the big thing is, is that you can use EQS to just choose things and you can you don't have to run it from a behavior tree it's a little weird how it works logically but the easiest way to think about it is that this bind event is just saying to the C++ portion of it this is the event you need to call when we're done oh okay because EQS can take multiple frames to complete and it's meant to do that like it I think it has a hard cap of something like three milliseconds a frame that it's allowed to take up and it's configurable but you can be like, nope, no more than three milliseconds. And if you take longer than that, then you're just going to have to wait till next frame. Pauses its execution, comes back onto it next frame, goes as far as it can. If it finally completes, then boom. It says, okay, I'm calling into the event that you have given me. Here's the thing that I, here are the things that I've chosen. And if you're wondering why, uh, well, I, I think I explained it, but just in case, you do have an option for, you know, single random best from best 5%, single random from best 25%, or just single best item. This, uh, of course, we had to return all matching because we didn't know what things were on cooldown or not. So we had to manually check that. So there's a bit of overhead for that, for getting this to work. Um, is this the best way to do this? Probably not. I mean, honestly, probably doing a tag system that just simply said these are high, these are low, and then choose one that isn't on cooldown would probably be a little bit more efficient than having EQS return a bunch of stuff but the EQS does prevent us from never, pardon, does enable us to always have a place to spawn. Um, even if everything up there was on cooldown, it doesn't matter, it's going to return everything so that we can eventually iterate through everything. Um, so, oh man, it is already three. <sighs> so many crashes. All right, well, before I start getting into, there's, yeah, so much stuff to go over. Uh, we're going to have to go into answering questions, and what I'm going to try to do is we're going to try to load up the persistent map, uh, and we're going to see if we can maybe get it to run through the demo, and then uh, while it's loading, I can answer some of these questions, and afterwards, I'll answer more questions, and basically until Fortnite comes in here and kicks me off. Um, so, uh, I got a couple questions here. q and A. I'm using a lot of null nav modifier volumes to call, out lo uh, to call out lots of areas that I don't want nav mesh generated. I also place several obstacle nav modifiers to steer navigation from high cost areas. Is there a downfall to using nav modifier volumes? I figured the null volumes help to reduce nav mesh size. There are no downsides to using nav modifier volumes. Use them, love them, they're great. Um, uh, create your own custom um, uh, area types so that you know you can prevent guys from moving into an area unless it's the last resort just by increasing the cost to move into the area or the move through the area that way they're like it's really expensive to move through there so I'll go around or uh, it's the only choice I got to go through because it's the cheapest route or you can do it by having a custom 
uh, nav type, you can then tell things like EQS to be like, no, 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 you don't cast there. No point will ever drop onto that point on the nav mesh. So even if there would be one there, nope. Uh, that helped us prevent uh, the AI from, if you're ever facing the train tracks, they will never stop on the train tracks. They always move off the train tracks because there are no valid points within there because it has a custom nav modifier in there. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's no downside to, to using them. Um, <coughs> why can I rotate and shape nav modifier volumes to affect nav mesh generation and not the nav mesh bounds volume itself? After developing with these volumes, it would be simpler to just change the shape and rotation of the nav mesh bounds volume to better fit my landscapes. Um, honestly, I don't know the answer to this. I believe it has something to do with the voxelization that occurs when it's actually generating the nav mesh, that it's just easier for it to occur in world space based off the bounding volume of the, uh, of the, uh, pardon, the volume that you've created. And that's just it. I mean, it's, it would be easier to do that, but you want to call out an area, you might want a sphere, right? So you don't just take the square bounding volume of that. Um, also, if you're using it on landscape, you might want to look into nav invokers. Um, I don't, we haven't done a stream on those yet. I think, uh, uh, I always butcher his name, Mieszko uh, mentioned it briefly the last time he was on with me, but we didn't get into it. Uh, if you're working on large, large data sets like that, use the invokers. I mean, it'll make your life infinitely easier in that regard because then the guys are just, oh, I, I have nav mesh and it just generates around me and you have nav mesh and it generates around you or whatever is an invoker, it just generates around them. That way you never have to worry about like, okay, I have generated a massive nav volume for the entirety of the in, in North America. Like, no, just just don't do that. Like, just have it generate at runtime. Um, and I'm not entirely sure, but I, th I've been playing a lot of Arc. I love Arc, by the way, guys. I've been playing a lot of Arc, and I'm pretty sure they actually do that. Um, I, noticing like when you hop on like an animal, and then you hop off, and you tell them to follow you, like they don't do it immediately, especially if you run off real quick. I think it's because it's generating nav around them to get to you, because while you're on them, you're not a nav. They're not a nav invoker, so it's really kind of interesting stuff. And yeah, I'm still loading in the background. <laughs> oh, you guys can actually. Oh, okay. Um, and now, next question. Say our AI is controlling a bunch of character enemies in open world. How would Epic optimize enemies that are far away? Do you destroy them and recreate them if they get close? Do you hide them? I assume it's not just the AI that consumes CPU, it's the actual character. Uh, I don't know specifically how Epic would do it, but personally, sleep them, hide them, if they're already there. Um, sleeping is basically, you just turn off tech, right? You're just like, nope, you're not doing anything. And if they're a character with an animation blueprint, you you stop tick on that as well. No more no no more animation updates. Um, you put their brains to sleep as well. I mean that minimizes them. And if you hide them, then there's no rendering cost. S killing them off and then spawning them, you have an overhead for spawn, right? We we just went over this. There is a pretty heavy overhead for spawn. So maybe you don't kill them. Maybe you just kind of have them in the area, or you have a pool of them to pull from, pull from, uh, and then you're just like okay. Uh, players moved within range. Um, I know, personally as a game designer, where I would want my guys to be stationed on this map, but I only have five guys, but I have 30 points where dudes should be. And if I think about it, then, you know, two would be up on the walls, two would be on the ground, and one guy would be inside, you know, getting dinner or something. And then you would just simply say, okay, well then spawn two dudes, you know, move two dudes to the wall, tick on, Animation on, brain on, and now that they're within range, you know they're they're you know they're doing their thing, and then you can also I believe adjust your tick rate, so that then if the player's still like you know a kilometer out, maybe you can see them. You don't want them constantly making decision, constantly hitting you know EQS or whatever because they're just so far out. Then yeah, you just adjust your tick rate back down for that and just have them not make a ton of decisions. Um, just stand around mostly, and if they really feel they need to move, that's fine. They can go ahead and move. It's just, you know, just don't eat resources if you don't really, really need to. Um, basically, fuzz it. You fake it. They're not really there. They're not living their lives. I mean, they're they're kind of just doing their own thing. I mean, and you can see how expensive they are. I mean, look at MMOs and things, right, where it's like, 
guys just stand around for ages waiting for you to come by and it's hard to get them to move around one from a player standpoint i never know where the vendor is i mean is he at home eating dinner or is he you know out buying more supplies or no we just he sits in his hut and he's always there able to sell you whatever you're looking for because it's simpler from a gameplay standpoint and from an ai standpoint having him live that life is overly complicated for what you may need I don't know. There's there's a ton of angles that we can approach this from. Um, but yeah, pool also. I mean, that was something actually I wanted to do for this uh, demo for when guys spawn. Um, I no longer wanted them to spawn. But to pool them, what I would have to do is you kill a guy and he goes ragdoll. A material function happens that makes him do this whole fade out thing that you guys have seen and he drops his gun. So for a respawn, that me are you having the line go across the background? Really? Really? Your progress line? All right. So you, you have, uh, so you, he's de but his body's ragdoll. His capsule isn't moving. His brain's been removed and destroyed at this point. So we need to not do that. So AI controller needs to be completely reset. Blackboard needs to be completely reset. He needs to be, the character itself needs to be moved to a new location. His ragdoll needs to be reset shown again, material backed off, and he needs to be given a new gun. Uh, maybe we even pool the guns, but we need at least three times as many guns in that pool than there are actually AI, just simply because of how long they last, and the fact you pick them up and you can shoot other people with them, right? Um, but then you run into a delay. So maybe the better option is, is that as soon as a guy dies, you you have a pool of uh, the meshes that you can pull from, their actual skeletal mesh, and you pop one of them in, you swap. So then, ah, ragdoll, disintegrate. So that way your guy never loses that, and you can immediately respawn him instead of waiting for the entire disintegration thing to take place. And then it's like, oh, okay, now I can use them, and they pop back in. Um, but the savings on that would be huge. I mean, we just went through the profiler. You saw that it was taking me, you know, upwards of eight milliseconds to actually spawn those guys on, you know, if they all freaking die and the choke point of 13 milliseconds would be like, that would be some serious savings. I mean, updating overlaps for forcing a character to move, you know, <clears throat> in that case, even all six of them would only be about three milliseconds if they all died at once, comparatively to 13. That's a pretty solid savings. So, anyway. Uh, what game content length are you aiming for with Bullet Train? Is it a tech demo, a short game, or hours of gameplay? It is a V... It's a tech demo for VR. It is not meant for any amount of length of time. I think the entire demo, if you're really, really bad at the beginning, will run you about two and a half minutes. Uh, the actual experience is only about a minute and a half, I believe. And that's just when you're down in the pit and you're just shooting and the boss comes, you throw rockets back at him, he explodes and you win. Um, it is not meant to be long. And honestly, after some cleanup, it's not going any further, right? Like, uh, well, actually, I can't say that. Maybe somebody will take it further. But as far as I'm aware, uh, my portion of the with it is done. I'm not even going to be a part of the cleanup for it. And so it's just, it's tech demo, it's done. It's not going to become a game. I mean, there are gameplay elements, but it's like there's nothing really going on. There's slow-mo, you catch bullets, you throw back. You're never in any danger. I mean, they throw grenades at you, they explode. It's meant to be their stormtroopers. You are the most awesome agent on the planet stealing guns out of their hands with telekinetic powers, teleporting around, beating them to death with their own guns, throwing bullets back at them. I mean, it's supposed to be that empowerment fantasy that lasts for a very short amount of time, and then you're done. There's no depth there. Um, is there an actual limit to world size, or can it actually be infinite? If we are referring to nav mesh... So, in context... You could work an infinite world, but that's on you. I don't think any. And what do you mean by infinite? Do you mean infinite in Minecraft infinite? Like voxel based, you know, procedurally generated worlds? Or do you mean infinite as in like infinite terrain? Like infinite terrain would be much more difficult to pull off, procedurally speaking. Uh, not undoable. I mean, it's just C++, right? I mean, that'd be your best bet, or else you're going to run into processing overhead for everything. That's kind of not what you want. Um, nav mesh generation? 
yeah, if you use the uh, nav invokers, you'd be fine. Um, or you have, you know, your major city locations have their own nav volumes and then just generates there and then you nav invoker around it based off of like the deer needs to move so it gets its own invoker to move around. Um, and you have you generate nav around you so things can interact with you, right? Um, infinite worlds, I mean, you're limited by your platform. So that's probably the bigger thing that you need to consider is not whether or not an infinite world is possible, but whether or not the majority of people you're attempting to target can even support an infinite world. Like, I mean, or what are you willing to trade off for it? Like, are load times acceptable? I don't know. Or do you want it to streaming load the entire thing? Well, then the infinite world needs to be smaller chunks, but then it's totally doable still. Don't know. I mean, is it possible? Yeah. In quotes, I mean, you're still probably limited by floating point precision at some point, but I mean, you just shift the world around and storage at that point. Yeah. Sorry, that was a rather waffle. Kind of yes. <laughs> okay, next question: Is it best to practice? Is it, is it best practice to store the controlled character within the blackboard so that you don't have to keep grabbing it from the controller within each task? Yes. Mm. No. Kind of. The problem is, is that you can only recall from the blackboard an actor. So there's not like there's not a git node that is that is more specific. Like git git AI player controller five, right? Like that very specific thing that you've made. You can't. You have to cast to it. You just do, um, because currently behavior tree doesn't have. I mean, there's support, like if we, that's still loading. So we have to say, if I could just load something to show you. If, if you were to go into your Blackboard and you look, like you create an object, and that object you can pull down on and you can be like, oh no, this object is actually an actor. Great, well there's actually every class listed in there. So you can be like, it is now this, enemy AI, right? It's my, now my enemy AI. Problem is, is that whenever you pull it, you pull actor. That's the best you can do. So you still have to cast from actor to the thing. Um, so you're still going to be left casting one way or another. Uh, arguably, if you need to get anything else, it's best to have it stored at least on the pawn. Because then you could be like, well, I mean, you could do that where you, you don't even use the, the owner controller and owner pawn. Where you're just like, owner pawn, cast to the pawn that I know that you are. And then on it, you have already precast and storage, your game mode, your AI controller, your uh, anybody else that it needs to be aware of, the player, just in case you need to pull something from the player. Like you have all those things like cached and stored and ready to, ready to rock. That way you don't have to do any secondary casts. That would probably be the best way to handle that currently. Um, I would hope that we could get in there and actually make it so that there is a, like, you know, the get all, you know, does an automatic cast for you now. You used to, you didn't always used to do that. You just get all actors, and it'd be of class, but it would they'd just be actors. And they're like, well, we should just we know what we want them to be because those are the ones you were asking for. We just automatically cast those out, right? So, yeah, no, there's, and unfortunately, a task is also uh, destroyed once it's run, so you can't like store it on the task. And so, unless it's like a service sitting there ticking, where you can do like a uh, the first chunk, it's like, oh, okay, stored, and it sits over there stored. But once the service stops running, like I think it has to recast again. But you know, you just you just use you know a do once kind of deal, and you're good. But for just normal tasks, yeah, you're you're probably better off either storing it on the pond or you just suck it up and you recast. And then <clears throat> you get a programmer to come through and convert it to C plus plus, and then the you know additional cost of that cast becomes so negligible it's not even funny. Um, anyway, let's see. <clears throat> Are there any caveats for using simple parallel? I've seen some situations where they crash or didn't work as expected. Crashing seems to be really mitigated at this point. I haven't actually crashed with them recently. Uh, the the demo is made on 4.9. Uh, there was only one minor modification made to the AI system, which is uh, actually on the character for the character movement component, actually slowing down for when it gets to a location rather than just immediately stopping. Um, 
besides that, I haven't actually had any issues with them. And I'm running a reasonably complicated uh, node for movement in there. Uh, the biggest caveat that I can say is just be careful with if you want it to immediately cut out. Remember to have any logic to reset after that point if you have it stop immediately once your main task is complete. Or you can just have it finish down there, but that has its own downside of, you know, well, what if finishing off that entire behavior tree down there takes a second and a half. Well, your caveat there is you need to be aware of what you were actually specifically trying to, you know, have them do. Uh, but again, stability seems pretty good these days. Um, <laughs> time's up, sorry. Uh, any plan to add support for dynamically added nav link proxies from Blueprint? <sighs> don't know. Sorry. I honestly don't. And the last thing here is from Alexander. It says, time's up. So I, is time, time's not up. It's only 310. Uh, well, I don't know. Wait, when's, when? <laughs> Oh, that's why it's not loading. <laughs> you and your damn basketballs. So it's been sitting there waiting for me to save, and I've been denying it. Yeah, it really wasn't my... Thought we were ending at three. No, no, Alexander, we're ending... Yeah, well, it's it's really more when Fortnite guys want to come in, right? So I think. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I hope they don't need to compile, because <laughs> it ain't happening. Uh, <laughs> I didn't break it. I fixed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's it's loading. Maybe. We can always check. <laughs> you, you're having way too much fun. I love it. All right, you know what? Probably faster. We just terminate this and reload it because I guess I just had it sit there for too long. Now it's confused. You have a start? Okay. Yep. Wait, a soccer ball? Does it do the same? No, it does something different. <laughs> That's awesome. This is like my favorite thing ever. <laughs> you get to do all the fun things on this one. So, why, why Spain? Do we have do we have all the flags? Oh, I don't know. Oh. See, that'd be that'd be the best. Be like Portugal, France, England. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unreal Engine is ESPN the game engine. <laughs> Come on. Come on. So close. Just load, please. Whoa. Whoa. Is that a zombie hand? Or a raptor hand? What is that? Oh, it's an alien hand. Uh, Alexander, did you see any other uh, questions come through? Oh, wait. Uh, I'm reading one. Uh, any suggestions for uh, huge amounts of AI, say more than 200? Uh, controller AI, above them. Don't allow them to make all the decisions on their own. Give them guidance from above. That way something else is deciding the things that they want to do. The uh, crowd controller can make actually like moving, have them moving around be kind of nice. Again, it comes with the caveat that they might kind of slow into and around things, which can kind of feel unnatural, um, but it's also like really new. So and hopefully we'll be changing up here before too long. Skip restore. And then, um, just remember that if you're allowing them all to tick in any way or form, you're going to be eating performance. The other thing is, is like, um, like, I don't know if we're ever snagging it or if it's ever coming in, but like uh, skeletal mesh instancing and animation blueprint instancing kind of deal, where instead of 
you know, a single animation blueprint per guy. You kind of have like an overriding one that kind of drives a chunk of them. Maybe you can break that up in some fashion because uh, that's going to eat a ton of performance. Uh, don't, uh, if you can get away from using the character movement component and do it yourself because they're kind of simplistic, then that could probably save you a chunk. Um, but you lose out a lot of the really good stuff in there. Like, you know, we already handle how to jump. Uh, we already handle, you know, ducking and things along those lines. We have actual, you know, code for that. So, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do. It's just, it's a numbers game at that point. You got to start trimming, you got to start trimming a whole bunch of edges. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to use nav invokers. I mean, if they were all invoking nav, you'd really want to have pre-divine nav. Um... Let's see, maps, 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 maps. Jeez, what else would I do? Lots of stationary time. Lots and lots and lots of stationary time. Um, don't have them all doing everything at once. I mean, movement's one thing because then your, you know, your crowd behavior is kind of taking over at that point, your uh, crowd controller. But then the rest of it kind of just, let it, let it be just animation driven, kind of just Make them look like they're doing something without actually having to make them do stuff. Like, if you're doing a market scene, you know, they can they can walk up and look like they're haggling with somebody, but it's not that they're... You don't actually have them haggle, right? It's like they probably already got the fruit that they want in their inventory. It's like, I walked up to the dude. Under the hood, it's like, oh, I've, I've purchased the orange. Okay, well, you already have the orange. Don't worry about the, the process that happens underneath or they're haggling, don't give them money and things along those lines where they actually have to deal with that. I mean, can you imagine a game like Skyrim if everybody had a wallet and they had to go to stores and they actually had to purchase food and drink and rooms and and how much they would have to go through just to be like, think about paying for something, you know? It's like, just avoid that. Just avoid it altogether. <laughs> um, and we're loading demo P again. Okay, well, maybe this isn't going to happen. Maybe this isn't going to happen. Is Ian Alex's boss? No. Make them look like they're doing something without actually doing anything. That's right, Alex. Look busy. Is that a guitar? <laughs> oh, sweet. That sounds awesome, Alexander. Yeah, and yeah, I'm on. Pardon, Alex. I'm on, turn, I'm on team learning resources. We do more than Doc, man. Come on now. Can you have a pool of generic A actors and use set mesh to make them look different? Different, or does that use spawn under the hood? Uh, no, set mesh isn't spawn. I mean, you're. It's cheaper, but it still has an overhead for for doing that. If you already have like the mesh loaded and you could instance it out in some way, which is something I think maybe Fortnite has. Yeah, I mean, if you, some of you guys want to hang on for the Fortnite guys and ask them that question. Because, <laughs> I mean, they have tons of dudes running around. I mean, they, they put up the massive, uh, the massive uh, uh, enemy AI stuff, like, I don't know, a year ago. And they've just been pushing it ever since. And it's not like what they're doing is really low end. There is a lot going on in a scene. And to have... 50 husks running around doing different things, different animation states, whole nine yards. I mean, that's expensive in some way or form. So they've got something and surely it's gonna make it back into the, uh, um, into mainline here before some time. I mean, we're constantly reintegrating stuff back. I just don't know if it's been activated or not. Um, so in short answer to question, can a pool of generic A actors and set mesh and make them look different? Yeah, that's probably cheaper. <laughs> Are there plans for instant scale mesh, com uh, instant scale mesh components? I believe so, um, but I can't speak to it one way or the other. I, it seems like something that's going on in Fortnite. It may not be specifically instant skeletal mesh components or instance skeletal mesh components. It could be some other methodology that's improving performance. Um, AI without behavior trees possible or worse for performance? Uh, <laughs> possible and. It depends on what you're doing.
So again, it always comes back to like, what do you want your game to be when you are not using behavior trees? Behavior trees are about making choices. If you already know the choices that you want the the, 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 your AI to do, like I want them to move forward 50 meters, turn left by 90 degrees, forward 50 meters, turn right by, you know, that kind of stuff, yeah. I mean, you are, there's a lot of overhead that goes into behavior trees that you're just not gonna simply use. Like, and you're also not gonna flex the power of it either. They're not making decisions. Behavior trees are about saying, Okay, this is a selector node, so I have four things down there, and one of them is what I'm looking for, so this one returns false, this one returns false, this one returns That one's true, this is what I'm doing. Go back up the tree, head to the next you know, select node, or the next uh, 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 sequence node, whatever's coming up on you know, next, and we just keep going, right? But that's all about making decisions, and then you do stuff with those decisions that you've made. If you don't need to make decisions, then why are you using behavior trees? I mean, if you if you needed a guard to literally patrol in a square and then break out of that patrol to shoot you if he sees you, you may not need to use behavior trees and it may be more efficient just to simply, you have these four nav points, patrol them in this order, and if player within range, shoot him in the face. I mean, that's a very simple branch, right? Like, and he's already doing stuff on tick anyway, so might as well ask. Like, oh, there's the player. Okay, I'll we'll shoot him. Um, and then behavior tree on top of that. I mean, it might be more reusable in the behavior tree at that point. Again, again, it all comes back down to what are you trying? What is what is the over? What are you trying to do holistically into into your game, right? That would be the real question that I have to ask back. Is using EQS to spawn an AI faster than picking a random point on the nav mesh and doing a line, uh, line of sight trace? Um, faster. <laughs> faster. M maybe. It depends. Using EQS to choose a spawn point was more about making sure something always spawned. A random point on the grid wasn't good enough because we had positions where you were and positions we wanted them to spawn from. So if I had an open field and I just wanted to make sure that something spawned behind me, then it would still be better to use EQS because then I could guarantee something spawning behind me um, comparatively to just, you know, a random loop of choose a location, choose a location, choose a location, choose a location. Um, Uh-oh. Message log showed up. We might actually be finishing loading. It's getting close. Um, choosing a random uh, start point. For, uh, let's just say, let's, let's mix up the question. Say, you just choose a random start point. Well, okay, but that might mean that a guy, yay, we loaded. That might mean a guy spawns in front of me when I want him to spawn behind me. Or that might mean a guy spawns above me when I wanted a guy to spawn below me. I want more fine control of that. And EQS is giving me that control, but also giving me fallback without any additional work on my point. And while it may be more efficient to say, I'm just letting it build navigation guys down here in the corner. So uh, the AI will actually work. Um, so if for whatever reason, the EQS is like, man, you gave me 5,000 spawn points. I really need to calculate this. Okay. It's going to take three milliseconds a frame. And it'll take three milliseconds every frame until it finally solves what it wants to do, and it gives you back your answer. Then what you do with that answer is up to you. Um, so, but if I were to randomly choose a location and then just do line of sight checks of 5,000 points, oh, okay, that's probably not going to work out in my favor just given that at least half of them are in front of me. And you could assume with that many points, a number of them are gonna be visible to you. What if it takes more than three milliseconds to find one of those points? Well, that's not great. But on a smaller scale, you know what? On a smaller scale, there'd be no point not to just do randomly. I mean, you just need to make sure that you have a, a list of them and you start removing them from the list. I checked that one, no. I, I, no, stop, stop choosing that one, right? Like, instead of just saying, Give me all, choose one randomly. It's like, no, get all of them, dump them into a list, take that list and be like, 
Okay, randomly choose this one in on the list. Is that one good? No. Okay, remove it from the list. Now randomly choose again. Remove it from the list. Randomly choose again. Remove it from the list. Um, <coughs> that you would see, you would eventually find something much quicker that way. Yeah, that one actually be all right. I mean, then you're working with arrays and blueprints, and that gets a little, you know, there's a bit of overhead for that, but not that big of a deal. So, and why are we still building nav? Peak. Come on, nav. Let's see if we can force it. Or make it worse. Good job, Ian. I can't, if there's no nav, it's not going to do anything. So, why are you choking out so bad? Let me guess, we ran out of dry space again trying to build nav. Question, would it be possible to code behavior tree into a blutility? I'm not sure about your use case. Oh, there we go. Something built. Come on, a little bit more. Yay, more. Oh, now it's streaming textures. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not entirely sure what you're, what you're looking for here, but I do remember there was a guy who, um, who was doing a, a random dungeon thing I think it might even be up to be put on the uh, marketplace. And he used the behavior tree. I'm not sure if it was just the interface or if he used the underlying uh, logic in there to make it go, you know, oh, this room connected to this room based off of all these other decision making. It looked, it's, it's amazing. I, oh man, I can't remember where it is. Um, and now you're going to save. That's, that's great. I love you, computer. Um, so if you needed a blutility to currently possible, probably not. But if you wanted it to, I can see a, a, actually some really good use of case use cases for that. Like you're you're working in your level and you're like, man, I have 50 different things in front of me. You know, I don't really want to make this decision. From my camera's location, blutility, give me the three best points and make a decision on those three best points to turn them into trees based off of how much they will occlude. And then, yeah, behavior tree would be like, okay, I'm gonna run through all the points. Tick, 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 tick. These are the three best. Boom, let's turn them into trees. And the blue utility goes, bam, trees, done. I could see a use case. Oh, good, we're done. Okay, so right quick before I get started. And yeah, sorry. Right quick before I hit play and crash again. Um, so you can see here, this is green on either side, and this is orange. This is what I was talking about before when they are not allowed to sp uh, stop on train tracks. They're also not allowed to stop on the uh, escalators. So they will choose a point, be able to happily move through here, but the EQS will never place a point here. So it's it, they're kind of handy for that. And yeah, oh wow, it worked. Yeah, quote me on that one. Um, so, okay, everybody, here we go. Okay, okay, that's, uh, alt, does that work? There we go. Bullet train. Uh, yeah, there's sound. Yep, ah, oh, damn it. You guys didn't see that, hold on. Uh, F11, I keep forgetting if you hit backspace, it like kicks off everything. So don't hit backspace, just hit Alt and R. Alt and R. Can they hear this sound? Sweet. Alt, R. So I'm not going to... I have WASD controls, but I'm not going to move around. Um, Agent, this is command. This train is about to arrive at the incident site. And I've been through this Before enough time just there, to kind of we'll to know over your new the operation. Ability. By the way, this tunnel Before is so awesome. Ryan Brox is a wizard. Up Hold down the teleport button to boot up. Charge up my teleporters. Bloop. Good. Ooh. It's fully charged. Whoa. 
You're a quick learner. Remember, hold, hold it again. Bloop. All right, that's how you teleport. You can use it to move around the environment. Notice when you hold Open the, the button door. to teleport, the world Open also the door. slows down. Use that to your advantage when the action gets hectic. Bloop. Grab those guns. And then E. Now try to shoot the targets as they appear. This is really hard when you can't actually aim down the sight. Teleport ahead to grab a better weapon. Bloop. You'll find a shotgun. Okay, get it in that hand. The enemy has found me. We are now pulling in oh, they just took my shotgun away from me this time. The enemy will be waiting for you. Why they took them out? By the way, uh, I'm luck, flicking agent. the uh, my wrist to uh, cock the shotgun. I don't know if you guys can probably briefly see the shells like flying out of it. They don't inherit momentum, so the train moving is like they're just flying off the back of the train. Oh, there, there's one. Hi guys! What's going on up here? Grab and throw bullets. There we go. I'm gonna move around a little bit to grab a bullet. Kill it with a bullet. Grab a gun. Nope. Teleport over here. Kill that guy with that gun. Uh -huh. Okay. Shotgun! Oh, he ran up to me and he hit himself in the face with my gun. Oh, no! And then grenade! Grenade! And then give me your gun. I want your gun. Thank you. Give me your gun. Still you have your own gun. Yep. So, bloop. You can actually see it in my hand over here. And I can look and... Kill that guy with his own bullet. Probably wasn't his. I uh -oh. picked it up with the wrong hand. So much easier when you actually have hand controls. Come on. Come on. Bullet. No. There we go. Bullet. Bullet. By the way, this was the most fun thing to do, as far as I was concerned. I mean, I mean, without actual hand controls, it's not like I can actually punch them. You guys shouldn't be allowed to stop down there. Why are you stopping down there? Oop, teleported to that guy. Give me a gun. Teleport up here. He's confused. Alright. You guys can die off now. There's a guy down there. Oh, that'll bullet. Shotgun! Just gonna try to kill you guys quick. Run around and sweep the gun through them. They touch the gun, they die! And I lost my hand. I don't know where it went. Grenade, grenade. This is. This will be the last guys. We are picking up a massive energy surge in the area. Use caution. Yep. Boss time. Hello, boss. Oh no, my bullets are deflecting. Come on. What you gonna do? What you got? What you got? You got nothing. You can grab the rockets and aim them at the enemy. Oh no. They added a new system for him, so not even sure. Yeah, they're a little bit guided. Nope, that was terrible. Ow! I don't want a gun. Uh, and try that. There we go. Grab that one. Be, I think one more. Bloop. Yay! We are winning! Simulation complete. And then well more of Ryan Brux's magic. No joke, he's a wizard. I know. 
And the way he optimized it was amazing. Apparently it's actually three different shaders because putting into one was too expensive. So it, it switches between them. <laughs> and that's that. Unreal Engine. I'm going to hug it with my hands. There we go. So that was the uh, demo and all of its hilarious glory. So, yeah. And I'm surprised that one of the questions hasn't come up is like, will this be released or anything like that? And I, I believe we're talking about doing so, but I don't have any firm dates for anybody. Oh, and something about uh, RVO2 on Trello avoidance system. Yes, all the actually AI are using RVO. Uh, it's avoidance. So basically, if they come in contact with another RVO agent, while they're moving, they will shuffle around each other and then try to get to their uh, nav point. They, uh, they're kind of interesting in that they will, they brush against each other and then based off the weighting of RVO, will choose whether or not they're trying to push through to their point, if RVO is like all the way down, or if they're like, okay, well, diverting wide and coming back in. So yeah, RVO too, well worth it if you don't need detour. Uh, detour AI again has that slow thing. RVO they just like they just run at each other and work around each other really well. So anyway, that's really all I have for this time. I think we need to do a whole nother stream, probably using the same project where we will combine. Uh, let's see the the pawn controller behavior tree EQS and MBP and a bunch of other stuff like game mode and AI, you know, command controller and things along those lines. So uh, maybe next week, or am I on, are we on a two-week schedule again? I don't know either. All right. Maybe next week or the week after. And uh, take it easy, guys, and we'll uh, talk at you then.